curving off this way. We would describe this as a left thoracic curvature. Or you can simply be safe and say left convex thoracic, and maybe it would come around in the opposite direction in the lumbar spine, and then it would be right lumbar convex scoliosis. So we're inspecting for just how things are lined up. The next thing that we'll do is palpating around the spine. The structures that we typically palpate are the spinous processes themselves. So I'll just come around and with my thumb, place about as much pressure as it takes to blanch my fingernail. So just coming down gently over each of the spinous processes, the little bony prominences that you can feel as you're palpating. And you're going to, again, put just a modest amount of pressure as you work your way down. Ask for any reproduction of symptoms. If, if any of this hurts or bothers you, please let me know. And we work our way down. All right. We're going to palpate also. If there's an area that's symptomatic, we'll look at the paraspinal muscles, feeling for areas of tenderness, getting a sense just for the quality of the muscles. If one side feels particularly tight and spastic compared to the other side, then we want to make note of that. And we'll work our way down the spine. Just trying to get a good overall sense for that. Good. And lastly, we're going to want to palpate right over the sacroiliac joint. So I'm going to scoot your mm -hmm. trousers down just a touch here. There are a couple of little dimples that you can just barely see. You can certainly feel them fairly easily on most people. And we simply want to put our thumbs into these little dimples and ask for whether the pressure over there feels at all tender. No. Nope. Good. The sacroiliac joint actually kind of runs down a little bit in that direction. But get into that sulcus. That, that's where you know that the SI joint starts, and it's certainly most easily palpated. Next, we're going to assess for our range of motion. So we'll typically assess for range of motion in the neck and the lower back. For the range of motion, I'll typically have you face me. So I'm going to look for the cervical range of motion by having you bring your chin down towards your chest. We usually should get a good, relax back up, a good 45 degrees or so. If we consider his head in the neutral position here, he should be able to get his chin down to his chest, which would give him about 45 degrees of flexion. Good. Relax back neutrally. And then we're going to have him do cervical extension. Try to look up towards the ceiling. Bring your head all the way up there. Good. And he should be able to get his face pretty much parallel to the ceiling, which would give him about 90 degrees of extension. So if he comes close to that in terms of his range, that's excellent. Next, we'll look at side bending. I'll have him bring his ear down towards his shoulder on one side and then on the opposite side. We're going to be looking for side-to-side -side differences. It should be about symmetric on both sides. And certainly, we're going to look for if any of these ranges of motion create any pain or discomfort. So that's side bending. And then we'll look for lateral rotation. So we'll have you twist off and look over your shoulder on that side. Good. And then on the other side. Again, looking for side-to-side -side differences, reproduction of pain or discomfort. Excellent. Now we're going to look at the thoracolumbar spine range of motion. So what we'll ask him to do first is to bend down towards his toes. Before he does this, I'm going to warn him that this is not a torture test. If this causes too much pain or discomfort, I'll ask him to come back up. We don't want to create any new problems here. So we'll ask him to go down, bend down towards your toes. And normally, the amount of range that we should get We'll get the trunk about parallel to the floor, or somewhere around 90 degrees in terms of the flexion. We'll watch for, as he bends down forward, this lumbar lordosis reversing itself. So go down one more time, please. And this actually becomes just a nice, smooth, kyphotic curvature all the way down. Excellent. Come on back up. OK. We'll look next at thoracolumbar extension. In this case, I'll try to stabilize on the back and the hips just to, just to give him a sense of stability. This isn't a common position that most people find themselves in, so we don't want him to lose his balance and fall. One more time, arching back, and we should be able to get at least 30 degrees or so of extension. 
right down here in the low back, which he does nicely. We'll look next at side bending. For side bending, we'll want to, again, compare from side to side. So we'll have you bend down towards the right side. What we should see is a nice, smooth curvature. You can kind of see how his spine curves towards the right. Each piece curves a little bit towards the other side. Same thing, nice smooth curvature, at least 30 degrees side to side. Sometimes if there are muscles that are spasming or if there's a problem that's causing a lot of pain in the lower back, this part of the spine will remain relatively stiff and most of the motion will come from the upper back, most of the limited range. Lastly, we'll look at rotation. And so again, I'll try to stabilize to some extent at the hips, ask him to twist around and look over his shoulder towards me relax. We stabilize the hips because it's possible to rotate a lot at the hips. If I just have them rotate, you know, we want to, we want to distinguish now what's coming from the low back from uh, the hips, so I'll try to stabilize. And now we'll have them twist the other way. And we get a sense that at least a good portion of that twisting then will come from his lower back. Next, we're going to look at some special tests for the spine examination. The first one that we're going to do is called the Sperling Maneuver. The Sperling Maneuver looks for evidence of radiculopathy. When the nerves from the neck exit the spine, they go through relatively small foramina. And if the foramina are narrowed because a disc is herniated, they'll be smaller than they otherwise should be. So what we'll ask our subject to do is extend his head back and then sort of bring your ear down towards your shoulder. We can envision as he gets into this position that the holes on the left side of his body where those nerves are trying to come out of his neck and exit down in towards his left arm are going to be smaller. We'll further make them smaller by giving him just a little gentle axial pressure on top of the head. So pushing down on his head again, to try and make that hole smaller. And if he complains of, not just neck pain, because this can be uncomfortable for anybody, but if he complains of pain that kind of radiates from his neck down into his left arm, that would be considered a positive spurling test. And we'll do that for each side. So for the left side and now the right side. A little pressure on the top. Good. 